I think my decision to become a composer really happened at the age of 14 when I heard for the first time The Rider's Spring by Igor Stravinsky and shortly thereafter the fifth Brandenburg Concerto of Johann Sebastian Bach. And then uh, a couple of weeks later, Bebop with Charlie Parker and Miles Davis and Montgomery Kenny Clark. I think that cast a certain die and uh, I'd say that's basically it. It's Gonna Rain, 1965. Was a friend of mine said, you know, you've got to hear this black Pentecostal preacher in Union Square in San Francisco. I happened to have a portable recorder and a sort of little shotgun mic, and I went down there with him and recorded this guy who was talking about, the, who was preaching about the flood, you know, the flood of Noah. One of them of the loops said, it's gonna rain. It turned out at the moment that he said that, a pigeon took off. And you hear this wah, 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 wah. And if you loop it, you get like a pigeon drummer and this, it's gonna rain, it's gonna rain, and kind of low hum of traffic. And it makes for an amazing loop. And I thought, well, if you had this playing against itself, you could kind of get to the point where you'd have, it's gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna rain, 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 rain. So I had two little cheap wall and sack tape recorders most people will never have heard of. They, they were you know, little monophonic machines with a little speaker built in. And I put the two loops, which I tried to make as identical as possible, on each machine and just pushed to go by. And I'd say after about three, four, five minutes, I finally heard it's gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna rain, rain. Well, I thought, well, you know, that's nice, but getting there from unison is a seamless, uninterrupted process, and that's unbelievable. And that became it's gonna rain, which was in a sense for me opus one. After it was done, I got a very queasy feeling that what am I going to do? Spend the rest of my life cutting up tapes and making loops? I mean, I want to write live music like I was doing as a student. And uh, as I was doing before, I got involved with tape loops. But I felt two things. I felt, A, I want to write live music, and B, this process is from machines. It's from tape loops. It, you can get railroad bells that are rail crossing, you know, that will go in and out of phase. You can get windshield wipers on a bus or a car that will go in and out of phase. But people? Can people do that? I made a, a recording of a piano pattern, which is basically became piano phase, and put it on tape recorder, it went round and round and round and round, and I sat down at the keyboard while it was going around, and I said, okay, I'm going to start in unison. I'm gonna get just a little, slowly move ahead of that until I get one sixteenth note ahead. And that was like sort of opening up the floodgates. Piano phase, 1967. Drumming was a huge, huge success. Drumming, 1971. My ensemble presented the world premiere of drumming. We did it at three locations in New York City. And there was a bunch of kids came and people who were going to the museum and some artists. They probably didn't know me from a hole in the ground. And uh, they just reacted naively and just loved the music, and really, really uh, expressed that. The end of drumming, when all these instruments play together, is really my exit from the, from the hardcore minimalist thing. But I didn't really realize it at the time. In Music for 18 Musicians, right away, for the first time, the piece was structured on harmonic change. And that was a sea change. Music for 18 Musicians, 1976. Music for 18 Musicians had a number of, of innovations in that it had no conductor, it was a large ensemble, it was based harmonically, and it had a very rich orchestration. It was also uh, originally recorded for Deutsche Grammophon, but released 
on the jazz label ECM, and as a result, he's now sold, I think, over 200,000 copies. It changed my life on, on every level. And in those days, what I was doing was so removed from what Stockhausen, Boulez, Berio, Cage were doing that people wouldn't take it seriously. They would laugh at it. Thankfully, there are now literally hundreds of musicians around the globe, most of whom I don't even know, uh, who because of recordings drifting into their lives or uh, teachers showing them something when they were very young, are fantastically good at phasing, playing different trains, playing music for 18 musicians. Uh, but that wasn't the case in the 1960s, 70s. Different Trains, 1988. It just popped in my mind these train trips I took as a kid between my divorced parents, my singer, songwriter, mother in, in Los Angeles, and my lawyer father in New York City. They were divorced when I was one, so between the ages of one and the ages of five, I used to spend six months in New York on the train with my nanny, Virginia, four days on the train out to Los Angeles, six months there, and then back four days on a train to New York, and so on and so forth for, for five years. I recorded Virginia. She was still alive at the time. I found Mr. Lawrence Davis, who was a retired black Pullman porter from back in the 40s, who had ridden those same lines, and he was in his 80s at the time. As I was doing one, I began thinking, now, wait a minute, what, what years, when did this happen? 1937, 1938, 1939, what was going on in those years? Well, what was going on in those years is that Mr. Hitler in Germany was trying to take over the world, and getting his hands on any and every Jew he could get and carting them off to first uh, around Munich and then eventually off to Poland. And so I thought, aha, different trains. Fortunately, I was on trains that went between New York and Chicago and Los Angeles. They were on trains that went to Poland and Auschwitz. While I was working with different trains, I, sort of the light bulb went on. I thought, wait a minute. I'm working with audio tape, and you don't see these people who are speaking, but what if you are? I was working with a video artist, and you were interviews of these people, and you s saw them speaking, and you saw musicians right next to them playing what they said. Hey, there's my opera. I think of Abraham uh, like this. And uh, this led to the commission for the cave. And most importantly, I spoke to Bella Corot, who is my, my wife and who is I, one of the uh, great video artists we have of our time. The Cave, 1993. It's a polytheistic society. In the early 1990s, doing The Cave was so technologically advanced that we had four huge refrigerators for the synchronization of multiple uh, tape playback. Uh, because it was a five-screen piece. Beryl did, was one of the pioneers of multi-screen video, so this was a multi-screen video installation in a theater. So um, it was quite a deal. I'll show you where later. Abraham comes and leaves. Just leave mother, father, and everybody else and go. Abraham comes and leaves. Since it's going to rain, basically what happens is the plot has gotten thicker and thicker, uh, i.e. from playing you know, one instrument or one tape loop against it, itself to all kinds of instrumental combinations. I think if somebody heard It's Gonna Rain and then they heard Daniel Variations or even Tatooine, they might not think it was the same composer. And I'm, I'm delighted. I think that's great. None of us knows the future, despite what we may think. But my, what I see is that basically the best you can figure out is if, the, if, if a lot of musicians from different areas of music really like what you're doing, and a lot of musicians from different areas want to play what you're doing, then you probably have a chance of, of survival. <laughs>